Hey guys, Mr. Klein here, and we're starting on our new chapter here in World History on Ancient Egypt. We have two lessons that we're going to pack together into one because they're both pretty short. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started talking about the geography of Ancient Egypt and uh, the Old Kingdom. Now, we started our last chapter on Mesopotamia, and that's this area up here in the Fertile Crescent. Now we look to Africa. And in particular, in the northeast corner of Africa, right here. And what do you notice about Egypt? If I zoom out just a little bit, you can see that there's a lot of brown and things like that. But then there's a little bitty sliver of green. And that green is because of the Nile River. And just like how we talked about the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, uh, the Nile River was a center of early civilization. All of this stuff right here, and even today if we look and see that throughout the Egyptian desert, all we see is green where the Nile River is by and everything else is nice dry, well not really nice, but dry desert. Uh, and so that's what we're looking at. And the existence of the Nile River uh, is solely based on is the sole reason that Egypt even exists because if we go back and we look and zoom out of Egypt and the China and you have the Saharan and Libyan deserts over here all of this stuff is essentially uninhabited no one lives out here so if it wouldn't be for the Nile River right here you would have essentially nobody living from over here by the Atlantic all the way across the Sahara all the way across the Libyan desert and apart from some little settlements along the seashore nothing right here except for maybe Rehad Saudi Arabia so all of this essentially has nobody living there because it's so harsh and inhospitable except for this little part right here the Nile River and that's where the ancient Egyptian civilization was and the Nile River starts down by the equator in the jungles and it brings fine black silt uh, that's very rich for farming and like we said it turns normally arid desert into rich farmland and the flooding happens uh, in the more southern parts of Egypt in the spring more northern parts of Egypt in the fall and it lays down this uh, nice sediment to allow plants to grow and ancient Egypt uh, developed along a 750 mile stretch of the Nile organized into two kingdoms one is what we call Upper Egypt, the southern half, and Lower Egypt, the northern half. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, normally rivers run, when we look at it as a map, from like, from like, you know, north to south. And so why are they calling this bottom part upper and this lower part, this up here, lower? Well, the reason why is because remember, rivers always run downhill. And the higher elevation is up here in the south. And so this area was known as Upper Egypt. And then this area is known as Lower Egypt. And the Nile it, River itself has two major features we need to know about. And one divides Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. And that's what we call the cataracts, which are a series of rapids. And it's where the Nile River jumps down several hundred feet in a relatively short span of time. And this is where uh, boats traveling along the Nile River would have to get off and move their loads by hand or by... Uh, livestock and so it was a nice nice natural border that divided upper and lower Egypt now where the Nile meets the Mediterranean Sea we have what's known as a Delta and that's a triangle shaped area of land made by soil deposited by a river It's generally in the shape of a triangle and as we can obviously see right here the Nile Delta is a nice triangle shape now where we live in South Louisiana we know lots about deltas if we go look over here we have the Mississippi River Delta, which isn't exactly in a triangle shape, but it's more of a bird foot, which is another type of delta. And while Louisiana is having to deal with a lot of coastal erosion, especially in this area, Louisiana does have two little areas where it's actually growing. And as we can see right here in Lower St. Mary Parish, which in case you're wondering, Morgan City is over here. And... New Orleans is over here. So in this area right here, the Atchafalaya River is actually forming two deltas. Uh, this one is kind of a more of a blob as much, uh, whereas this one is forming the traditional triangular delta. If you look, you see the legs part out, it comes in, 
and this area. So this is the only place that land is actually growing in Louisiana, and that's in two river deltas right here. So if we go, we leave Louisiana, and we head back to Egypt, we can look at the Nile, and we can look at the way civilization formed here in this area. So a delta, once again, is a triangle-shaped area of land made by soil deposited in a river. And over thousands of years, the silt and soil was laid down there. And even today, rich farmland is uh, is where most of Egypt's farming is at and where most of the people actually live in this area. So people settling and stuff. Let's talk about this. The Nile River is, of course, attractive to hunter-gatherers because, as we saw, there's, like, life and water and stuff where most of the area was dry desert. And hunter-gatherers first settled there around 12,000 years ago uh, and found plenty of meat and fish to eat. Farmers were farming barley and wheat in the area, just like in Mesopotamia, as well as raising sheep and even cattle, unlike Mesopotamia, by about 4500 B.C. And so because they were in a dry, arid place like Mesopotamia, the rise of cities and stuff was broadly similar, uh, similar and happened at just a little bit later than in Mesopotamia. Now, by 3200 BC, Egypt had organized into two kingdoms, okay? Lower Egypt being ruled by a city called Pei, and Upper Egypt being ruled by Nekin, okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at these two cities real quick. And if we look at Pei... It's up here actually in the Nile Delta, right here. This little, this little area surrounded by cities and stuff is the actual ruins of the old Lower Egypt capital. And as you can see, not much to it, but you can see this general area, this squared off area is where the city was at. So that is Pei. Nekin is much further south. And we zoom in, as you can see right here, and in this area, was Nekin where we could actually see we could actually see the site. And as you can see from the footage, you can see the old settlements. And then also if we go over here, we see another set, we see other evidences of settlement. And here it is, here's what's left of it on a hillside. So not much to it, and these towns are really small. We have to remember that, because there wasn't a lot of people back then. So it's not surprising that their cities were small. Now, this is where Egypt starts getting going. And around 3200 BC, Egypt was united by a ruler by the name of Minis. Okay, and Minis was Egypt's first pharaoh. Now, in the historical record, we actually don't see somebody named Minis. Okay? And so what Egyptologists or historians who study Egypt pretty much agree that this guy named Narmer, uh, from, and this is a picture we call the Narmer Palette, it's one of the oldest examples of hieroglyphics in ancient Egyptian art. We kind of figured that this guy is Minis. Uh, so Minis is kind of like a name given to this early ruler. And he was known as Egypt's first pharaoh. Now the word pharaoh means ruler of a great house. And it makes sense that we would use the term pharaoh to mean a ruler of a great house because a pharaoh was usually wealthy uh, and owned the biggest house in the area. And also, great house could also mean a great house or ruling dynasty, which is a term we'll get together to a second. With the U new United Kingdom, Minis built a new city to rule his kingdom from. And this city named Memphis, no, not the city in Tennessee, but the Egyptian city of Memphis it was named after, became the capital of Egypt. And if we look for Memphis, we can see Memphis is actually, the ruins are still there. And it's further up, it's kind of halfway between the two. And here are, here's some ancient ruins of the settlements and stuff. And... This is in the park where it's at. And we'll look at this uh, statue of Ramses a second. But this area and this museum is the old is the old capital of ancient Egypt. Okay? All in this area. So that's where Memphis is at. So if we zoom out and we look and compare Nekin and Pei, we see that Pei is closer to Memphis, but Nekin is much further south. But the reason why is because more people lived up here than down here 
in Upper Egypt. So Minis dynasty, or dynasty meaning a series of rulers from the same family, uh, was the beginning of Egyptian rule in the Egyptian pharaohs. And his family, or series of rulers, nephews, sons, things like that, ruled for almost 200 years. And so that was Egypt's first dynasty. And there was well over 20 dynasties in Egyptian history. And we'll, we'll talk about some highlights of them, because obviously there's so many, it's kind of hard to talk about each individual dynasty all at once. So that's it for the first part of the lesson. Let's go ahead and let's look at the second part of the lesson, which is the Old Kingdom right here. And around 2700 BC, the Third Dynasty, or Old Kingdom, began establish. And so for almost 500 years, this family ruled ancient Egypt. And so because it ruled for so long, that's what makes it so important for Egyptian history that this group of families this group of families ruled for about 500 years and so as a result as a result they influenced a lot of Egyptian history now during the old kingdom the Egyptians were ruled under a system that believed that the pharaoh wasn't just a king wasn't just a really wealthy guy but he was also a god okay he was considered to be like the sun god incarnate in other words in human form here on earth so being pharaoh was you know not you know you weren't just king you were also god and so everyone had to worship you and not just listen to you because you were king now the most famous of the old kingdom pharaohs was a guy named khufu for whom the largest of the pyramids were built and we'll talk about pyramids in a minute and in a lesson later now for all that we know about khufu the only known image is this uh, ivory idol at the cairo museum in egypt it's the only known image of him and He's wearing the headdress. He doesn't wear the beard like uh, later pharaohs would, but he does wear the headdress that's similar. And so he was the most famous of all the pharaohs, and, and mainly because he built the great big huge pyramids, the pyramids of Giza, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Now, being pharaoh uh, meant that you were a god and you are a king, and you also owned everything in the kingdom. Everything was yours. Everyone pretty much just borrowed your stuff. Okay, the land, the air, the water, the food, everything belonged to you. People might think that that would make life easy. After all, I own everything. I'm the richest person. I mean, even your money is mine because I'm Pharaoh and because I say so. However, it was the opposite. It was actually really hard. The Pharaoh was cheered if he succeeded because, after all, uh, the god pleased uh, the people. Uh, he pleased people by providing with good harvest and stuff. But he was usually personally responsible if something went wrong. And we have evidence of pharaohs getting killed because people were unhappy with them. And being God and being king and owning everything was kind of hard. So the pharaoh couldn't manage everything on his own. So he appointed government officials, mostly from his own family, to take care of problems that he couldn't serve, which begins the beginning of the Egyptian government and sets the stage for the social hierarchy that we're going to look at in a second. Okay, and so let's talk about the social hierarchy. Now, the pharaoh, because he was god and king, was at the top all by himself, not even his wife or his children. Okay, he was at the top by himself up here. Okay, this is the pharaoh at the top of the Egyptian hierarchy. Below him were his wife, his children, and everyone, his family and the nobles from rich and powerful families made what we call the upper classes, the high priest and stuff like that. So the pharaoh's family and the wealthiest people, the nobles and the priests, high priests were up here and the nobles. And so these are the upper classes. The middle class is right here. Okay, of course we know these are craftsmen and also scribes. Okay, and they also included some lower government officials that maybe that he might have been experts in some things, so they weren't exactly related to the pharaoh or very distantly related. Scribes also and very rich, rich craftsmen. So you had to be rich to be in the middle class. The vast majority of people in Egypt, however, were just farmers, and they provided food for everyone else in Egypt to live off of, and they belonged to the lower class. And below them was an even larger group, uh, was a large group, not quite as large as the farmers, though, known as slaves. And the slaves were generally the ones, and sometimes farmers and laborers, who built the pyramids and other great things in Egypt. Okay, so here are the farmers, here are the slaves. So to sum up the Egyptian social pyramid, we had the pharaoh all by himself at the top, Below him are the nobles and the high priest. In the middle are the rich craftsmen and scribes. You have 
poorer craftsmen and farmers and laborers and pretty much everyone else here at the bottom. And even below them were people who had no rights and they were slaves. Now they weren't as much as this lower class in terms of population, but they were at the bottom of the social pyramid. So let's talk about life in the Old Kingdom. So in the Old Kingdom, everyone in Egypt was expected to follow the same religion. Yay, you all had to worship the Pharaoh um, and other gods. And certain cities built temples to honor their gods. Now, a big part of Egypt's religion was known about life after death. And that's a term that we call the afterlife. We call the afterlife. And Egyptians believed that their life force, known as the Ka, existed after death, but it was linked to a physical body. So when you died, your Ka just kind of hung around your dead body. And they believed that the Ka and the body was separated. The Ka would suffer. As a result, the Egyptians began to preserve the royalty and a few wealthy people as mummies. Okay, preserving the bodies and wrapping them in cloth. Okay, so mummies were only reserved for the wealthy and stuff. Uh, the poorer people, they believed that uh, their ka would just hang around the body until it disintegrated and rotted and stuff. And so there wasn't much you could do about it. And so this is an actual mummy of Ahmos II. Uh, mummification, which we'll talk about way more in class. Okay, so I'm just giving a brief overview. Mummification was very detail lots of steps as you can see even thousands of years later we can actually see his hair and generally what they would do is they would pull out certain organs like the heart where they believe where all the thinking and stuff was located uh, and preserve those in jars in can uh, canopus jars uh, but other things like the brain which they didn't think was that important would just be pulled through the nose and thrown out and and when we talk about mummies we'll talk about mummifying cats and all that stuff and we'll get into that but wealthy people's mummies would be placed in a tomb for the greatest pharaohs, however, especially in the Old Kingdom, huge tombs known as pyramids were built. These became too expensive because you'd have to spend so much time building them that the pharaohs would instead later on mummify themselves and just throw them in a place known as the Valley of the Kings. And see, here's an ancient Egyptian mummy also. So let's look at the pyramids. Here's the Great Pyramid at Giza, which is by the capital of Egypt, Cairo. And Khufu had these built, and see here's here's a here's a modern day camel. But here's the Egyptian pyramids, really huge. Okay, the only one of the seven wonders of the world still surviving. So here's the pyramid here. Here's more of them. Okay, here's smaller pyramids, and over here is the Sphinx, which we'll talk about we'll talk about later in the chapter. And here's smaller pyramids for Khufu and his family and his sons and things like that. So, but where they ended up getting buried because it took so much of the population and actually affected money uh, and food in the kingdom was this area known as Valley of the Kings. In the Valley of the Kings here, you would have individual tombs, okay? And these individual tombs would be where people where the pharaohs were buried and so they'd be buried in these little spots in the walls of the valley itself okay and so th because it was so dry and it was so hidden the bodies were so well preserved that we we're able to see them even today so here that's the valley of the kings let me zoom out some more where you can see how it's in comparison valley of the kings is over here uh memphis the capital is here and also by cairo and the great pyramids were there so to wrap things up, just remember that the Nile River is the home of Egyptian civilization because it brought water and nutrients and f uh, farming land for ancient Egypt. Uh, ancient Egypt was divided into Upper and Lower Egypt, divided by some rapids called cataracts, and most of the area was centered on the delta, the triangle-shaped area of land. Um, it was settled about 12,000 years ago. Minis was the first pharaoh. He united the kingdoms. Pharaoh, of course, means ruler of a great house. And he started the first dynasty, which is the uh, series of rulers from the same family. And the old kingdom is the third dynasty, which lasted about 500 years. Khufu was the most famous pharaoh. He built the pyramids. The pharaoh was considered a god and a ruler all in one. Uh, and in the social class, he was, he was alone at the top. We had the nobles below him. Craftspeople and scribes, wealthy ones. Everyone else was at the bottom, and even below them were slaves. And in Egyptian society, religion was especially important, including the afterlife. 
and the gods and the wealthy people uh, wanted to preserve their bodies to keep their spirit waiting around in the afterlife so they use mummification in order to keep those bodies preserved so that's your lesson yes I know two lessons 10 minutes apiece 20 minutes in total uh, but that's all the information for you if you have any questions please let me know and thanks for watching